The last line of the music you heard uh, on the piano, in the piano prelude, prelude is a prayer. Come Lord, as we gather and worship you today. Just that. Come Lord, as we gather and worship you today. Our opening song is Psalm 790. Take time to be holy. We'll stand and sing the first three verses only. Taken from the first letter of Peter, the first New Testament letter of Peter, chapter 1, verse 13. If you're following in the core Bible, it's page 1217. 1 Peter 1 13. What I'm reading is part of a, a general letter to Christians scattered over a wide area. We call it a circular in these days, I think. An area defined in the New Testament as Asia Minor, but what is now modern Turkey, a country that is very much in the news in these days in connection with all the deeply disturbing <coughs> events in the Middle East. I think that if every situation needed the continual fervent prayers of Christians everywhere, that's it. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 30. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as God who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners on earth in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that we were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to us from our ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, a sacrificial lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but he was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Would you have a look at, if you're using the Salvation Song of Song Book, would you look at Psalm 360? I'm going to use the chorus now. Holy Spirit, promise and present.
know, sometimes we find it difficult to believe that God's Holy Spirit is really interested in us, in you and me. How can he understand my deepest fears, my anxieties, my struggles, and what I'm going through at the moment, my future, my employment, my social care. As we concentrate our minds on the truth of his presence and power falling on us, as we have sung, let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us here this morning. In spite of all the barriers that come between us, that would frustrate our desire to commune with you. Help us to put aside negative thoughts and distractions so that we can truly know that your Holy Spirit has indeed fallen upon each one of us, making us all we long to be. And what you, Lord, long that we should be. We lay before you all that is unworthy in our lives and day-to-day -day living and ask for forgiveness. We bring to you members of this Salvation Army community together with our friends and neighbours who need your healing touch upon their minds and bodies. We ask for your divine comfort for the bereaved, for the lonely, and the friendless. But above all, we pray that this meeting may inspire us to be better people through the teaching from your word, the songs we will sing and play, and our fellowship together. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Look back on that experience as distinctly remember. My wife and I presented two of them in Brazil, and uh, we never forget. For some years, they, as you will know, they were a brilliant and unique contribution to Salvation Army music making all around the world. A number of the songs have become part of Salvationist hymnology and are now included in our songbook. Well, here's one of them now, number 329, if you're following in the songbook. That's the spirit.
no kind of receiver. Now let's turn again to scripture. These words come from the second New, New Testament letter of Peter. If you're looking it up in your own Bible, it's chapter 3, verse 11, 14, and 18. 
My dear friends, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God. So do everything possible to be blameless in God's sight and to be at peace with him. My wife and I spent over 18 enjoyable years working in Forgotten Salvation Army in Brazil. Five of those years were spent as the Corps officers of the Central Corps in the great city of Sao Paulo. One Monday morning after the usual busy Sunday, I was sweeping the steps at the entrance to the hall when a young lady, I would think probably in her 30, early 30s, stopped to look at the notice board the core notice board with a list of our weekly activities. Seeing her interest, I said to her in her, her own language, well, see, yes, you always there still the self self. Do you know the salvation army? She shook her head. No, no, yes. No, I don't. My see, evasion was so quite a dear Avisos que vocês têm um ADN de santidade de cada domingo de manhã. But I see from your notice board that you have a homeless week every Sunday morning. And then came, and then came the question. O que o exército de salvação ensina sobre a santidade? What does the Salvation Army teach about holiness? It was very hot in the streets, so I suggested to her that we went into the hall, where it was much cooler. So we sat in the back row, and I explained to her, briefly and simply, the Salvation Army's doctrine of holiness. Then she told me a very interesting story. She was medically trained and had volunteered to be part of a social service team that was going to do relief work in um, one of the most deprived areas of northern Brazil, a very long way from Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Brazil is a big country. When she arrived there, she found she'd been attached to a, a group of Roman Catholic nuns who had been ministering in that area for some time. She very soon became so impressed with the dedicated work of the nuns that they were doing amongst those deprived people. That she asked them what it was that continually drove them, that inspired them, that made them so cheerful. And they answered, in the wrong language again, a santidade. Holiness. Holiness. Not making any Christian profession herself, but she didn't quite understand what they meant by holiness in that particular context. So their mum's explaining to her what they meant. And she said to me, Eles disseram mais ou menos o que você me disse. They said more or less what you said. The important thing about the whole episode was that she had seen, seen holiness and its practical application daily in the lives and the work of those nuns, and it had radically changed her own thinking and her whole outlook on life. Over the years, uh, especially those years since the Second World War, great changes have come about in our army, driven mainly by the radical changes that have come about in the world and in society in general. If you remember the years before the war, you know the, the change that came about in the world after the Second World War. 
But my personal prayer is that the Salvation Army will never change its position as regards those two great foundation stones of our Christian belief, salvation and holiness. There they are. I don't think they will, because William Booth, its founder, said to his soldiers one day in his forthright way, if this army ever ceases to preach salvation and holiness, then I hope the Lord will bury it. And if I'm alive to, I'll attend the funeral. <laughs> As salvationists, we believe that it is possible to live a holy life in this world. And that it is the privilege of all believers to be holy. Frederick Cooks, the army's Eighth General once wrote, Holiness is an experience of divine grace for normal people living normal lives. Holiness has also been correctly described as a, as a crisis followed by a process. The crisis is the experience of being saved, being converted. If that conversion is sincere and genuine, then the experience is radical and life-changing, as we would say nowadays, mind-blowing. I think that's how the young woman felt when I met outside the hall in some part. Having been saved, Holiness is then the process by which we keep saved. And this begins at the moment of our conversion. There's an old song by uh, Major Sidney Hubbard that describes this crisis and process in three verses. Unfortunately, it didn't seem to find its way into the new song, this old song. The first verse begins in the past tense. Jesus saved me. That was the crisis. The decisive moment when we sought God's forgiveness and placed our lives in his hands for time and eternity. Uh, you may well remember the time when that happened to you. And the place where it happened to you. Maybe at a mercy seat like this one. From the quietness of your own room. The second verse of the song begins in the present tense. Jesus saves me. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, the saving work continues. It influences every waking moment, every desire, every choice, every decision, every attitude towards other people, every relationship, through the process of holiness. Another song we sometimes sing has this line, I live a moment at a time and Jesus saves me now. For an eternally mortal, infinite and unchanging God like ours, it's always now. But that's a big subject for another occasion. The third verse as of Henry's, sorry, Sidney Hubbard's song begins in the future tense. He will save me. He told me forever when my work on earth under the continual guidance of the Holy Spirit is completed and I meet God face to face. Holiness involves the training and the refinement of all our personal qualities and, and the development, and this is important, the development of all our potential. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth said, the Holy Spirit normalizes people. It makes them truly human. 
He makes men and women what God always intended them to be. Like Jesus. As human beings, we're totally unique in all creation because we have within us God's precious gift of free will. We have the capacity to make decisions, and to make choices. But for whatever reason, we don't always make the right choices in our life. What we do may be wrong because we lack knowledge and experience because we are hampered by heredity or by our environment or because we have a tendency to despair and to give up when the battle uh, against temptation gets tough. Holiness doesn't make us infallible. That's because we're forgiven the sinners, but we are not yet perfect beings. That would need perfect judgment. And perfect judgment belongs only to God. Holiness is a lifelong work in progress. The progress of the divine life toward perfection. But if we do make mistakes, then we must ask God's forgiveness, make restitution where that's possible, and move on. Every movement towards Christian perfection signifies a movement away from those things that if they were allowed to continue would eventually destroy us spiritually. <coughs> Our desires for goodness can be perfect. That's the spirit of the Lord in being, as we say. God doesn't mock his people. He doesn't call them to do anything for which he can't empower them. As John Gans also said, he reminded of those words, he said, God's Holy Spirit not only tells us what to do, it helps us how to obey. All goodness has its source in the goodness of God. And when he frees us from the guilt of sin, he implants within us something far more powerful than sin. And that is faith. Faith in God. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, talking one day uh, to his students around the dining table in the college refectory, he said, anything that is of God is right for the man or woman who has faith. God never asks us to have faith in anything that is irrational. In Christianity, faith and reason go together. They're both sides of the same coin. They complement one another. And they enable us to grasp properly the truth about Jesus as Savior and Lord. Faith unites us to Jesus. Jesus, who totally trusted his Heavenly Father, I mean, let's do the same. Sustained by prayer, as he always was. Prayer. That is talking to God and listening when he talks to us. I learned that definition of prayer 80 years ago from a faithful teacher in the Salvation Army Sunday School. Talking to God and listening when he speaks to us. Jesus is our example in all things. As the author of the New Testament letter to the Hebrews writes, we must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Our Christian calling is to be like him. Because anything contrary to the spirit of Jesus is unholy in the Christian code of conduct. 
To briefly sum up then, holiness is a matter of always striving with the help of God's Holy Spirit to do the right thing for the right reason in the right way. In his letter to friends in the church at Philippi, the Apostle Paul wrote this. Work to complete your salvation. And you can do it, not on your own, but because God is always there. Strengthen, and I like this, willing you are, willing you are, for the moment when we will be saved eternally is closer now than it was when we first believed. Our final song is song number 814, the song if you were following the little words there. You will sing verses 1 and 4. Rest on. Amen. Amen. Amen.